we all thought and for a number of generations we thought that uh, this is a one time thing right you learn you uh, clear clear school clear university or whatever it is find a job and that's the end of the story you continue to work in the same location for like 30 or 40 years and you retire with a beautiful golden watch and that's the end of life that's not the that's not how it is these days right we all know that longevity in enterprises is very limited the average uh, employee uh, is switching jobs every 2 years every 3 years every 5 years depending on the domain they are in right so one of the things that the world economic forum is talking about <clears throat> is that 50% of all employees who are employed today will need reskilling of some sort by 2025 and one of the interesting things i like about this data is that this is not about uh, what needs to be done somewhere in the future that is like 30 or 40 years away right this is about the next 5 years and trust me 5 years is a very uh, recent timeline it is not that far away that we can think that this is not going to happen to me or this is not going to happen to my generation or by the time this happens something is going to happen that's going to prepare me for that this is 5 years away right and trust me this is a typical case of a camel in the tent before you know it it will come to a point where all of us are going to be having to reskill ourselves it's not just the reskilling needs there is also the fact that uh, all our core skills are going to get changed right now this is a very interesting uh, perspective it's not just that uh, you know the peripheral skills the things that you add as you come along in your career that are going to change it's also the fact that all the core skills that we have right so if you identify as an engineer or a uh, linguist or somebody who has studied literature or whatever it is or a mathematician or a science graduate or a physics graduate or whatever it is right? they we identify yourself those core skills will need change right that's a very interesting paradigm because these core skills are things that we have built into our repertoire of education over the last whatever 10 years 12 years or 15 years of your schooling and university life right now if you come and tell me that what i learned as basics or what i learned over that long period is going to get changed has to change it's going to be a quite a challenge to be able to pick up those uh, skills and run with that uh, ball right next is uh, there's always the skill shortage this is a very interesting uh, perspective and this is data that has come out not from any other organization but our very own isaka isaka state of cyber security survey in 2020 talks about these very interesting statistics right there's going to be a skill gap top 5 skill gaps you can look at it and if you look at it very closely there's some interesting data in there right it's not the normal hard science skills or the math skills that are going to be in shortage it is going to be the skills that we rarely pay attention to these days things like soft skills right how do you communicate how do you empathize in somebody how you be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and look at a problem from an interesting perspective right those are the kinds of skills that are going to be uh, in short supply of course there are other skills right it knowledge and skill gaps are definitely going to exist and then there is there are going to be other aspects as well for example insufficient business insight now this is a very interesting perspective as well because this originates from the fact that we all don't like to stick to the same thing right or we like to be i like to become a specialist in a particular area but the area that i'm trying to specialize in is actually changing so fast that it doesn't make sense for me to continue to be specializing in that particular area right and then of course there are other skill shortage uh, statistics that are available right so 62% say the organizations are understaffed and 57% say they currently unfulfilled cyber position or cyber security positions on their team i'm just trying to use this data to tell you that it's not just some nebulous skill shortage out there that we're talking about we are talking about real hard skills that you and i could possibly bring to the table that are actually at short supply in number of organizations globally right there are other things also that we need to consider for example the rate of automation now this is again a very interesting perspective and i as i was preparing these slides i was thinking to myself how much the automation is impacting some of our lives right for example i have not gone to the physical branch of my bank in probably the last 10 years more than a handful of times and it's not because the bank banking has become so inconvenient but it's because the level of automation in the banking industry has become so much that except for some very very specific very uh, nuanced activities i actually don't have to go to the bank branch at all and it's just not me it could be all of you as well doing a lot of things that you thought used to do with human contact now being done without human contact and things like the pandemic are probably making things that much worse right and look at the statistics here again right by 2020 the level of uh, human activity in anything is about 67% and that becomes 53 by 2025 again i specifically picked these uh, pick this data just to tell us that this is not something that's going to be out there you know 10 15 years down the line or something that's futuristic that ai is going to take over lives by 2100 no this is 2025 this is within the life spans of all the people on this uh, call or on the people who could be listening in here and that could make an impact to all our lives as well right 
then of course the pandemic how can we talk about learning or how can we talk about anything that's happening in the world and not talk about covid right so i just thought that i need to put that uh, data out there look at what's happening because of pandemic the same world economic forum tells us some very interesting uh, data 83% of people are scaring to remote work which obviously is true i mean i have not gone to my office or many of my clients don't come to their office but it's the other two things that are actually going to be important from a learning perspective right one is that 84% are accelerating to digitization this is a very interesting perspective what they are telling us is that they are going to rely increasingly on automation technology technology that is going to try to take the human out of the loop for many things that we would normally consider a human to be doing right so for example today uh, you go into any e-commerce site you are able to order anything and have it delivered to your uh, residence without human contact obviously because covid is doing it the other side of it as well right earlier you used to be able to talk to a human being from a perspective of customer support today a lot of that has been changed and what you have actually is simply the fact that you are able to log in to a website use a chatbot and that's going to give you all the support that you can come right so there's again a change in uh, the skill sets that are going to be required from actually being able to do something to actually be able to look at managing something or managing something that is changing more dynamically than the human ability to learn at the same pace then of course my favorite and probably something that uh, you've all seen there's a lot of rise in what is called cognitive technologies right artificial intelligence and machine learning and those kinds of things are actually taking over and how are we uh, feeding these things right it's our own data the kind of data that we are all making available because we're using so called free services that are actually teaching some of these technologies what to do right so earlier what the teller used to do or what uh, the machine uh, human being used to do from the perspective of bank is actually something that you can do to an automated uh, teller machine and is not just the atm right today everything and anything can be done on a small piece of glass that you have in your hand the smartphone right i could send money across the globe i remember many many years ago when i came to kenya the first time to get some currency exchange was a very interesting exercise i had to go to a specific uh, government entity i had to prove my identity i do i had to do a lot of things right today it's not that it's simply a matter of being able to use the your device log into some of the most simplest uh, global service providers and you're able to do that right which means that we are actually trying to remove the human uh, element in this supply chain and trying to make sure that we can rely increasingly on these some of these uh, technologies and i'm not saying it's a bad thing right i'm only saying that this also means that we'll have to relook at how humans are engaging with all these things what is the human going to bring to the discussion what is the human going to bring to the argument and how is that going to be changed by how we imbibe and access knowledge other things that matter this is again very interesting uh, data you will see that there is a shift in the job landscape by 2025 uh, and you look at the kind of uh, decreasing jobs jobs that humans have been very good at jobs that have needed humans to be present right for example data entry clerks they're going to go away probably because the tools are going to take over or data is going to be captured in completely different formats right today a lot of the data that we are doing actually comes from our smartphones comes from our sensors comes from the iot networks comes from a lot of other devices which for various reasons cannot actually be even passed by a human being right can you for example uh, an average mobile device includes 15 20 different types of sensors right can you imagine a human being actually collating all the data even looking at it from one particular person apple for example has indicated research that the average apple user unlocks her, his or her phone uh, i think some uh, 150 times or 200 times or whatever it is during a day so a huge amount of good data is going to get generated which means that uh, there is going to be a decreasing job demand for doing a whole lot of uh, things whereas there is going to be a growing job demand for some of the other interesting things and by the very nature of these new uh, jobs that are going to come up what it going is going to go mean is that we you and i will have to learn at a different pace right for example take the simple thing that is line number 7 there which is digital transformation specialist digital transformation is such a dynamic thing it's such an interesting concept that is very difficult for anybody to be able to say that i'm a digital transformation expert because by the time you can actually say that word and get away with it the digital transformation has changed you have something else coming up and if you look at some of the newer technologies coming up uh, especially the internet of things things like the blockchain people are actually engineering these things to be free of human intervention right so the blockchain especially i've been doing a lot of reading on the blockchain and uh, the blockchain is actually be coming up with uh, things like the smart contracts where they're saying we don't need a human being to intervene at all autonomous organizations can run things on their own so what happens to you and me and it's not just the blue collar jobs that are getting affected right the physical jobs that we thought we are all secure from it's also the white collar jobs jobs like auditors what auditors do jobs like what accountants do jobs like what people in the investment banking industry do some of these jobs that we thought were always protected are actually going to get changed by some of these uh, shifts 
Then, of course, how uh, companies are adopting technology is also changing things. This is, again, uh, making a big difference. You look, look at this list of technologies that companies are expected to adopt by 2025 or expected to change between 2018 and 2025. And you will see that literally everything that we are using today is going to change and things are going to become completely different. There's increasing use of artificial intelligence, uh, text and image processing. There is robotics, uh, RPA, things like that, augmented virtual reality, a whole lot of things and things like the pandemic are actually pushing us to using a lot of these things, right? And if you look at this list here, you will find that it's not just one technology, right? It's a lot of these technologies that are actually taking over a lot of things that human beings used to do, right? Especially things like quantum computing will change the very fabric of some of these things that we do. And uh, the Quantum Computing Institute, there's something called the Quantum Computing Institute. They are saying that there is a one in seven possibility that quantum computing will become a reality by 2030. And there's a one in two that will become reality by 2040, right? I mean, it's not very far away, it's 20 years away, and it's a good possibility that all of us will continue to remain there. So what I'm trying to get at here is that all of these things mean that we need to learn and we need to learn more effectively. We need to be more creative, right? Of course, then this is another interesting uh, perspective that I wanted to share. This is something called the demographic dividend, right? And I was very fortunate about to get data specifically relating to Uganda, and of course, also about the world, which I'll talk about. What I'm trying to get at here is that the fact that if you look at this uh, shape of the age distribution over 2050 for different age groups, it has a pyramidical approach, which means the number of young people is going to be very high. What does this mean to you and me? It means that there are going to be young people coming at our heels, trying to get our jobs, trying to get skills that we probably need more time to learn from, and actually going to bring much more brain power than you and I can actually bring in, depending on what age group you are in, right? So this can actually change things. And there are a lot of perspectives coming in from this globally in terms of being able to empower. And the limitations of this is not just to your geography, right? If the technology keeps pace the way it is keeping pace, today people can get employed from any part of the world. And just contrast this with what is happening with some of the other parts of the world, and you will get it, right? Africa as a whole has this very pyramidical approach, which means that there are more young people and the number of old people are coming up, which means that the workforce is going to be very agile, the workforce is going to be very young, the workforce is going to be mentally very prepared. Whereas when you compare that to, they've taken a sample of Italy, but it could be any country in Europe, and you will see that there's a bulge in the middle, right? There's a lot of people who, like me, or like some of us, who are actually at that age group where learning is going to become a little more challenging, where the concept of neuroplasticity is actually going to be that much more challenging to get into, right? So it becomes uh, imperative to understand that lifelong learning is going to be the norm. There's no, no two ways around it. We cannot operate in a mindset where we say that, oh, I've learned everything that I can learn. I've got the graduation that I wanted. I got a great degree that I can have. And that is the end of the story. No, that's not going to happen. It's, it only means that we are, not going to, we are going to have to learn constantly and we're going to have to learn constantly new stuff. It's not just the same stuff that you know is a new way of doing it, right? It's not, that, it's not like trying to learn how I learned how to drive a car with a stick shift, right? I don't know how many of you have driven a stick shift. That is very different from driving an automatic car. So in a stick shift, you need to learn a lot of things. You need to learn how to change the gear, at what uh, speed you need to change it, how to depress the clutch and things like that. And when you get into an automatic car, it's a completely different volume, right? It's, it's a completely uh, luxurious thing to just put it into D and then keep driving. So th this is not something like that. This is something very different. This is like learning how to ride a bicycle all your life and suddenly being asked to fly an aircraft, right? Uh, this quantum jump that needs to be done in terms of what you're learning and how you're learning it. So you can ask me, so what? Like, what's the big deal? I'm going to learn. I've survived for so long and I will continue to survive for so long. Problems are there. There are many problems and we probably need to talk about some of those problems. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, trying to talk about some of the challenges that we usually face when we're learning and what we can do to overcome some of those challenges. First and foremost, of course, uh, and the, the most important reason why I want to talk about these challenges is because unless you recognize you have a problem, you will not be able to fix it. This is one of the fundamental psychological traits that a lot of people talk about, a lot of researchers find it about. So I just want to quickly touch upon some of these things, right? And uh, the bigger problem with some of these challenges is that unless we recognize them and unless we take positive action to mitigate or minimize them, it becomes very easy to get back to your old habits, right? Your mind starts behaving in the same way that you used to do earlier unless you take a positive direction towards fixing some of these problems. So what are some of the problems that we generally face? First and foremost is obviously distractions, right? This could be physical distractions or this could be mental distractions. And we are all used to it, right? I've seen many scenarios where people are not able to focus simply because they have a lot of things in there, right? And this has happened to me in class where I stop somebody in the middle of a CESA session and say, sir, you seem to be distracted. 
what's the problem and then you find out that they're thinking about something else right or it could be something outside you and the outside world trust me is extremely complicated especially to in today's world where we are able to do everything through a screen we once you plug in a headphone it's very tempting to actually start scrolling through our uh, twitter feed or uh, facebook page or look at our social media messages or, or think of something else right and distractions is actually delete the effort that you're putting in in terms of learning or picking up something so it's very important that we understand that distractions can be a major problem and this is also one of the reasons why a lot of efficiencies come down right because you're trying to do multiple things at the same time and i will talk about it as we go along our, we are very good at fooling ourselves in telling ourselves that i am very good at multitasking so actually what i am doing as i am listening to ragu probably is multitasking where i am trying to send a message or uh, send out a tweet or do a facebook uh, look at something on facebook or whatever it is but trust me there's a lot of research which tells us that multitasking is not very effective in fact what we are doing in multitasking is what is called very fast attention uh, swapping or switching right and when you do that it puts a very big cognitive load on your brain because the brain has only so much attention it can spare at any point in time and attention like any other muscle can actually uh, fall in capacity as it as you keep switching attention from one aspect to the other right so we need to overcome uh, managed distractions what are other things that you need to worry about cramming now i don't know how many of you are familiar with this but i'm sure we have done this we have done this very often because we like to prepare for exams we don't like to prepare for the subject or for applying it in real life or being able to use it effectively and this is partly a problem that we are uh, responsible for and partly a problem that probably the education system as a whole is given rise to right so what we are to, what we try to do and i remember this um, um, doing this myself at some point and i'm sure you've done this as well we try to prepare the prepare for the exam a couple of nights before right when i was in college we used to do this concept called a night out where people used to study throughout the nights before the exam just prepare for that exam give the exam and get out do you really think that's going to work at that point in time it works because again the brain has a bias towards familiarity the more you keep looking at something the more familiar it gets and the brain thinks you know it you fool yourself into believing that i know the subject but the moment the exam is done it's the end of the story right you don't remember any of those things so cramming is a problem that we probably need to overcome then of course there is this whole concept of what is called mass repetition so i'm supposed to prepare for the physics exam i just go and read physics uh, through and through i read the textbook front to back because i am trying to cram in as much as possible not really worrying about whether this is going to be useful and this is going to be something that i will be able to remember over a period of time and there's a lot of research out there which says that mass repetition doesn't help mass repetition in fact makes it uh, very difficult for the brain to actually absorb it because one of the things we need to remember is not the fact that we are able to read it but also to the extent of what we are trying to do by absorbing it recalling it and then uh, repeating it when we want it in the right context right that never happens when you look at it from a mass repetition uh, perspective other bad habits that we generally pick up focus we all lack focus and especially in today's digital world focus is pretty much zero uh, there are a lot of tools available out there where which, which can actually tell you how much time you've been focusing on for example many smartphones come and uh, come with applications which tell you the amount of time you have spent on doing different things right and many of us probably don't want to look at it because it's very embarrassing to see that after 11 hours you spent yesterday on the smartphone nine and a half of them was on social media the other 10% was watching uh, cat videos on uh, jiffy.com or whatever it is and the remaining 5 minutes was responding to an email right uh, focus is again very very important because the better you are able to focus the brain is able to absorb better and learning and uh, retention and things like that improve very often we don't focus we don't try to build in the right kind of situation to make sure that we are able to focus on what we are doing that becomes a challenge and then of course forgetting how many of you suffer from this right and i'm sure all of us suffer from this and this affects afflicts us in different degrees for example i've had this challenge uh, or i sometimes have the challenge where i am not able to remember people's names i can remember their faces very well but suddenly if you ask me to tell me somebody's name i probably don't remember it right and it's if it is something as simple as remembering a name and not being able to do it that may be okay because you can always have like some of these big people have a person at your shoulder who reminds you who it is right that's a different thing what if you are not able to remember concepts and how to apply some of these things that you studied and that you require to do in your actual job right now that's a very challenging uh, concept and uh, that is one of the problems that you can't fix by trying to google for something right because many times people think that by having access to a smartphone you can actually search for any information it doesn't work like that some of those things need to be in your mind because even searching is an art 
right? And unless you have access to what kind of data you're looking at, what you want to look for, you can actually search for it, which is why I'm sure you've realized this. If you've taken an open book exam, it's not as easy as it sounds. I remember taking my first open book exam and somebody telling me, oh, it's an open book exam. It's very easy, right? But it's not that easy. When you get the question at the exam, you need to be able to find out where in the book you can find it, how to conceptualize that uh, thing in the right way for the examiner to understand and evaluate your understanding of the subject, right? It's not that easy. So forgetting is a big challenge that we all need to remember about. Then this is again uh, very interesting, and this is one of the things I've seen uh, consistently again and again, especially when we are talking about uh, things like the CISA or the CRISC or any of these professional certifications, right? A lot of people come, and when they ask me what's the one thing I need to do, I keep telling them that you need to unlearn and you need to be able to relearn, because many times we learn certain things but don't connect them to the underlying concept. And this connection to the underlying concept is something that sets humans apart from machines, right? Because what a human being can do at its most fundamental level is apply abstract thinking, right? So for example, there are a lot of uh, instances where to teach an artificial alg intelligence algorithm or machine learning algorithm what a cat is, they had to give it millions of images of cats, right? And even the slightest variation of that image, the uh, tool is not able to do it. Whereas you take a child, Right? How many times do you have to tell a child what a cat is? Probably once or probably twice, and that's it. And the next time the cats, the child sees something that looks like, a, let's say, a Egyptian cat or some other breed of cat, the child is able to figure it out. Right? That is, happens because at a, at a very base level within our heads, we are able to take anything that's given to us, extract the concepts of what is unique in that, and then try to apply it to different situations. It need not be cats or dogs. Take how many times you've been able to open a door. How many times did somebody teach you how to open a door? There's a very interesting uh, video on uh, YouTube where uh, Google's engineers are trying to teach one of those robotic dogs how to open a door. It fails multiple times. But if you give the same situation to a human being, if you teach me this is what a door looks like in a concept, and usually you can open a door by pushing it or pulling it, I'm pretty sure we'll get it straight away, right? That's because you're trying to connect what you learned somewhere to the underlying concept. So that becomes a very interesting thing. And if you don't do this because of the various bad studying habits, you're not able to connect the concept and you're not able to retain it. Because at the end of the day, when you understand the concept, you're able to pick up anything and apply it anywhere. Right, which is why, and I'm sure you've faced this, and I've seen this often, is that oh, though people come to us with professional certifications and all kinds of uh, combinations of alphabets behind their names, when you start interviewing them, you will find that there is a gap. They are not able to explain something because they were able to pass the exam, but not necessarily imbue the underlying concept that is underlying uh, in their heads. Right, so that's a major challenge. Then, of course, so rote learning. Uh, this is again a problem that is there in many uh, countries and many many of us suffer from this at various points in life because the education system is designed such a way, right? All we are told is you need to pass the exam, right? Many times people ask me in my CISA classes saying, what should I do to pass the exam? And with a lot of pain, I'd explain to them saying that CISA or CRISC or whatever else it is, professional certifications especially are not about just passing the exam. They are about trying to make sure that you understand the concept and trying to make sure they're able to apply that concept in multiple scenarios, right? And I've seen uh, another scenario happen where people come to me with saying that I have X number of years of experience in a specific domain, but when you ask him or her to apply the same concept to a related domain, to something that is adjacent, you will find that they're not able to do it. Like risk management, how do you apply risk to A kind of industry versus B kind of industry? They're not able to do it because a lot of the emphasis on this, is on this. How can I prepare for the exam? How can I remember it? How can I you know, spit it out on the paper and then start all over again, right? So some of these things are very serious challenges that we, we need to overcome if you're able to learn uh, and learn effectively. Then of course, uh, we need to be very careful of the brain's biases. This is a very interesting thing. And uh, many times people don't understand that inherently, cognitively, we have challenges, right? So some of the challenges are very interesting stuff and stuff that we need to actually utilize to our advantage. I will talk about it when we come to it. But right now, what does it, things like a novelty bias mean? The brain has a lot of interesting new stuff, right? Which means that, uh, and some of these things, trust me, research has proven to be things that are linked back to when we were probably standing in Adam and Eve's time, right? They're linked to what is called as a lizard part of the brain, right? Now imagine you're standing, uh, you're an early man or woman, and you're standing somewhere. One of the first things you want to look for is threats that may affect your life. Right, so you're always scanning the environment to look at what's that new noise, what's the rustle in the tree, what's that new animal coming over there, what's that slithering thing on the ground. So the brain is configured for this novelty bias, and it's the same thing that happens when we're reading or studying or learning as well. Right, I'm reading some interesting concept, and then suddenly the phone dings. 
ah, it could be my friend, right? Or I see a little uh, window up here on my uh, uh, screen because I'm learning something through the screen and I think maybe it's a Facebook update or it's a new link that I need to pick up, right? And a lot of these things are also arising from, because we all suffer from what I like to call ADD, attention deficit disorder. I'm not talking about it in the medical sense of the word, but in the sense of the word that we are always moving from one thing to the other. And we like to fool ourselves by telling ourselves that, oh, I'm very good at multitasking. I can do a lot of stuff. So this is something that is very useful. Then the brain also suffers from this problem of familiarity. Meaning, if you keep reading something, the second time you read it, the third time you read it, the brain starts already thinking that I know these words. I know what I'm reading. I understand the concept now, which is not true, right? Because as you read more and more, you just get familiar with it. You're not actually imbuing it inside. You're not getting the concept. Then there is another challenge. Uh, uh, and the other thing I want to emphasize here is that I'm only listing some of the biases which are relevant from a learning or a education perspective, right? There are a number of other biases and uh, which may not, which may apply to the brain and the cognitive uh, senses, but which may or may not have a implication from a learning perspective. Now, recency is again a very interesting thing. The brain has the tendency to remember the most recent occurrence of anything. Right? That is why you will find sometimes if you had the opportunity to sit through a performance review that the person doing the performance review only remembers something, especially if it went bad, the recent past. Right. That is why many enterprises which are at the which are at a more mature scenario are actually expecting you to do a, a performance review or some of those things over the year. Try to look at all the data. Right. It's very easy to pick up one piece of information and evaluate or judge somebody uh, based on that. It's called the halo effect. Brain suffers from that. Then the Dunning-Kruger effect is very, uh, very, very interesting. And a lot of us suffer from it. And a lot of experts, people who claim to be experts are actually victims of this. What the Dunning-Kruger effect does for you is it gives you two kinds of uh, misinformation. Uh, One is it makes you overestimate how much you know. And it also makes you underestimate how much you don't know. Right. So imagine apply, being a victim of this. You think you know everything and then you're going to do something you actually don't know. The other side of it also is that you think you know a lot of stuff and you know you don't know only very little, which means it stops you from learning and acquiring and asking questions and things like that. Right. So it's a very interesting conundrum. Uh, both pieces coming together. We all suffer from blind spots. Blind spots are pretty easy to understand. Right? It's like when you're driving a car, you have certain parts of the uh, rear view mirror or something you can't see. It's the same thing here. Right. In fact, blind spots are actually what prevent us from seeing some of these other biases that we suffer from. And then, of course, there is the confirmation bias. I will talk about the confirmation bias and how it can have an impact, especially when we're talking in terms of creativity. Right. Because we all like to live in our own filter bubbles. And that causes issues in terms of especially being creative and being able to use some of these information effectively. So moving on. Unless we have a scenario like this. Right. I don't know how many of you remember this in a scene from uh, Total Recall. I'm an Arnold Schwarzenegger fan, and I remember this. Unless we have the scenario where we are able to actually, you know, have a device that can shove in information or pull it out when we need it, we all need to learn, and we all need to be able to relearn, and we all need to be able to pull what we have in our brains at the right point in time, right? So very important uh, declaration that I wanted to make, just to put it out there and some kind of a warning. What got you here won't get you further, especially. Uh, and then in the scenarios that we are operating where things are changing so much and a lot of these technologies are evolving so quickly, we will need to keep pace with uh, what is going on, right? So as we go ahead, I just want to do a quick exercise. Take a couple of minutes to look at this um, slide and then we'll come back and uh, as we go along, we'll discuss this. I have a reason why I want to do this, right? So I'm going to go ahead. I'm not going to let you linger on this. Don't take a picture or image or whatever it is. Just look at it and let's go ahead. Okay. So what is this learning that we're talking about, right? I know there are a lot of technical uh, definitions out there, but I just wanted to put uh, what I see practically and what maybe you all see practically and what you all think may you may agree with, right? It's In its very simplest terms, it's acquiring knowledge. I'm not using the word information or data here because that means different things. When you use the word knowledge, I'm trying to say it's something that you can use in a different context or use it for achieving certain means to an end. So you call it knowledge, right? The knowledge to configure a server, the knowledge to drive a car, the, the knowledge to, let's say, open a door or uh, one of those things, right? And that's just not talking from a pure data or information perspective. Then, of course, learning is also about storing it in memory, right? Now, this is very interesting. Because a lot of the biases that I spoke about earlier, and because of a lot of the bad habits that we all have picked up over the course of our life earlier, storing becomes a major challenge, right? We fool ourselves into thinking that I have stored it in my memory. And then the last part is again, very, very important, retrieving it when you need it, 
right now this is very interesting right you need to be able to pick it up when you do it and there are multiple ways of doing it in multiple ways of making sure that we are able to do this right and there's there's ways of ensuring that you can retrieve it there is this whole concept called muscle memory right where you do it so many times that it gets into part of your physiology and you're able to do it automatically so uh, going back to the example that i was talking about earlier of driving a stick shift car i have not driven a car with a stick shift in maybe 15 or 20 years but if you still give me a car with a stick shift i know how to drive it because it's in client it's in, embedded in my memory right or taking even something simpler how to ride a bicycle right once you learn about how to ride a bicycle is very rare unless you have certain kinds of uh, specific injuries to the brain you'll never forget it because it becomes part of your uh, what is called kinesthetic learning and you can actually do it right so this is what you're trying to do as part of learning three things acquire knowledge store it in memory and retrieve it when it is needed now this sounds so simple but it's not that simple because there are again many problems and challenges in how to do this right so one of the things i've believed over the years uh, is that what we are trying to do at the end of the day is move something that's in short term memory to long term memory right this is again very very uh, important for us to do because what is there in short term memory is very uh, ephemeral right it can disappear over a period of time simple take a simple example how many times has it taken you before you can memorize a telephone number right now once upon a time telephone numbers in india were five or six digits and i used to be very proud of myself that i could remember almost 100 different digits and whom it belonged to now i have so many uh, telephone numbers to remember number one and i have the luxury of having a device that can help me do it that i don't bother to remember them anymore right and there could be a lot of other scenarios like this so what we are trying to do as part of learning is trying to take something that is in short term memory to long term memory right you can ask me what's so challenging about it what's the big deal what's the problem in moving something from short term memory to long term memory oh trust me there are multiple problems the biggest problem is the fact that you have limited short term memory right uh, there's a lot of research and data into this that the short term memory can hold anywhere between 5 to 7 or sometimes 9 chunks or pieces of information right and you can try it try uh, try to make a grocery list right something that you want to go shopping for that your spouse or better half asked you to pick up and then try to see if you can just read it a couple of times and go and pick it up you won't be able to do this right so what we're trying to do or what we should ideally be doing for learning to work effectively is to move it from short term memory to long term memory and we need to do this as quickly as possible and the unfortunate part or the fortunate part here is that this is not something that you can control this is not a manual process right this is an automatic process this is something that the brain does automatically so you need to be able to achieve this correctly second of course is that we need to be able to strengthen storage and recall again this is a problem meaning i just want not only do i want to push it from short term memory to long term memory i want to remain in long term memory for a very long period of time right this is very interesting again because we are not uh, there are things that you remember for a very long time ago right and there are things that you learned 100 times before you probably don't know how to do you don't you're not able to recall it the second aspect is the recall piece of it right now recall is not as simple as going and typing something into a search engine and getting an answer like that right recall is being able to get the right kind of cues that tell your brain that this is what you're looking at which means that you need to build the right kind of hooks to get the brain to be able to recall something so this is the second thing that you want to build as part of your learning practice right one is move it from short term memory to long term memory second is strengthen storage and recall that's very very important and last but not the least all of us want to be more creative right in fact if you look at the data i will share again interesting data on this it is becoming increasingly important to for humans to be creative if you're not creative you actually cannot continue to survive and thrive in the economy of the future that that part of it is becoming increasingly obvious right and i'm not saying that you need to be creative like a uh, picasso or you need to be creative like one of your favorite music stars or any of the painters or architects or anything like that it could even simply mean creativity in the sense of solving problems as you work on them right and this is something that machines cannot do because machines need data machines need patterns and somebody has to feed it in the form that the machine needs to understand right which is not the way human beings work so creativity is again something that we all want to achieve so how do we do this uh, many years ago i was fortunate enough to go to greece and i remember walking into the uh, pantheon or something like that where i saw this which said know thyself right i'm not trying to get all philosophical on you and try to say that you need to go into a deep inner journey what i'm trying to say here is basically try to understand what makes you tick try to understand and analyze how you are learning what works for you what doesn't work for you and how can you use that in your favor right uh, this is all about using the right kind of tools and how to go about it 
to be able to understand yourself, especially from a learning perspective, I wanted to present three learning models. Now, I, one of the things I want to emphasize, and I do this all the time, and this is something that a lot of people who work with data and who work with models always tell us, a model is just that, right? A model does not mean everything that the model says is going to happen. I want to emphasize this because uh, like in uh, data science or big data, it's very obvious that correlation is not causation. Meaning, just because two things move together doesn't mean one causes the other, right? It's the same thing here. I don't want people to get uh, bogged down into the model itself. As we go along, I will also talk to you about the certain things, tools that I am not talking about. Right? I will not talk about certain tools because many times we end up investing in the tool and not in our understanding of what the tool can do for us, right? So uh, there's always this very famous saying, right? Uh, to somebody who holds a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I want to avoid that kind of scenario. So what are the three models that we can talk about? The first and foremost is what is called as a done and done learning model. Now it's a very interesting uh, model. And if you look at it, it touches on a lot of aspects. It basically tells us that you need to consider various parameters ranging from how the environment is where you're learning, what is your emotional state when you're learning, what kind of sociological situation that you're learning in, what is your physiological state, and then what is your psychological state, and how you apply these things to what you're trying to learn, right? And you may see some of these things, and as I talk about them, you'll be able to understand some of these things, right? For example, when you were in school or university, you might have been in a situation where some of us are very good at learning by ourselves, right? I was in a situation where it was easy for me to learn some subjects by myself. So I like to sit by myself and study or read or whatever you want to call it. For certain subjects, I found that I could use the help of somebody who was with me. So I used to pair up with somebody, especially things like statistics and maybe some of the coding that I learned. I used to learn it with somebody else, right? For certain kinds of things, maybe it makes sense for you to team up with people. Because especially when it comes to teaming, and especially when you're looking at it from a creative con con concept, uh, teaming actually means that you bring the complementary skills, right? Again, this is a tricky thing to handle because they are always talking about what is called as a multidisciplinary approach or an anti-disciplinary approach. The MIT Institute talks about it actually as an anti-disciplinary approach because teaming has its own problems and we need to be uh, careful in managing that, right? Then look at some of the psychological, uh, physiological aspects, right? Some of us are early birds, which means that we are, we are very uh, eager to get up early in the morning and then study. Right, and some of these behaviors change. I, in my, I can give you my own example. There was a time years ago when I used to be up at three thirty or four a.m. and I could actually sit and prepare and study and do a lot of things at that point in time. Right. Nowadays, I'm not able to do that. Not because I'm growing old or whatever it is, but more because I'm spending a lot of time uh, going to bed late at night. Right, which means that affects my uh, waking up schedules and that affects a lot of things that I'm doing from that uh, perspective. Look at the environmental aspects, for example. I don't know if you've had any friends who can actually read even when there is music, right? I cannot read if there's music playing and I'm trying to read a serious subject, meaning I'm trying to read something that is going to help from my work perspective, okay? The other perspective on the environmental thing is, I don't know how many of you are comfortable listening to audiobooks, right? I don't know if you all use audiobooks or you're comfortable reading a physical book or you're comfortable reading something of a Kindle. I'm okay with reading a Kindle book or a audiobook, I'm sorry, a physical book, but it's very difficult for me to listen into an audiobook. There are multiple reasons for this because the moment I start listening, it becomes a very passive activity for me. My mind starts wandering. I'm thinking of a thousand other things. And then I start focusing on very, uh, you know, uninteresting or irrelevant things like the nuance of the reader's voice. I start, I start wondering why did they choose? I was listening to this book where the author, the uh, person reading out the book is some Irish actor. So I was actually started wondering why they pick an Irish actor. What has Irish actor got to do with the subject? And it went to a whole lot of places, right? Other perspectives are there from an environmental perspective. Go and try to figure out uh, what temperature works for you, right? I, do you like to sit in a temperature where it's too cold? Do you like to sit in a temperature where it's too hot? Because some of these things have connections to other things. If the body is not comfortable, it's actually a philosophical conundrum called the mind-body problem, right? If the body is not comfortable, the mind doesn't work. If the mind is not comfortable, the body doesn't work. So there's a good uh, connection between that. Maybe you need to look at what kind of lighting works for you, right? Different people like to study and read under different kinds of uh, lighting. Look at the emotional states. There's a lot of research, and I will talk about it, uh, of the importance of connecting what you are reading to an emotional perspective, right? Because if you try to recall some of the strongest memories you have, they are all linked to a very Im important emotional aspect. Right? You're very happy, you're very sad, you're very angry, you're very upset about something. There could be a lot of those things. right? So if you're able to use that to your advantage, 
create that state of mind where you are very open to what you're learning that can have a big impact on what you're doing right look at uh, other things that are talking about here right look at how structured what you're studying is right some of us like to st study with a great deal of structure some of us like to study with a very open uh, style they can actually pick up the concept just by reading it right some of us need multiple examples to be able to understand this is what the concept means so there are different uh, uh, perspectives that need to be uh, applied look at the psychological ones as well some of us learn from a very reflective approach meaning i like to read something go back and sit in some place and then try to understand what it means it's like um, if you've seen a cow chew cud right it swallows whatever it is brings it back and then works through it right some of us may be able to learn something in a very impulsive manner i like to do it and then be done with it kind of thing this is one of the models that we can think of has a lot of relevance to a lot of stuff that we do and a lot of these environmental aspects or a sociological or psychological aspects could actually make a big difference to you when you're actually studying by yourself or trying to read or learn something at your own perspective now let me present a different model that touches upon a different uh, set of aspects right this is called the experiential learning model it's after a, a scientist called kolb uh, i think a german guy again very very interesting and if you as you as you talk about this you will say realize that some of these things you might have seen people do this right so there are people who are uh, activists right who like to do stuff who actually need to be given a concrete example of this is how you solve the equation or this is how you do the coding or this is how the problem works in a real world to be able to understand that there are people who actually like to simply reflect upon it give them the concept he or she is going to come back understand what they're doing and then be able to use it uh, effectively now if you look at some of the people on the bottom abstract reflective people we call theorists they are probably people who are very good at scientific research right who are very good at coming up with scientific concepts people of uh, einstein's capability or people of newton's capability they actually came up with some of these methodologies and things like that in fact there is very interesting data that uh, i think uh, Uh, trigonometry was invented by one of these people during a similar pandemic in his era right imagine if somebody uh, can invent trigonometry in a pandemic lockdown what we all should be able to identify when we're looking at some scenario like this right again depending on some of these uh, depending on what subject you're doing some of these things may be able to uh, may be able to apply right for example uh, let's say you're trying to learn how to fence right what are the ways you can do it if i give you a book a theoretical book on fencing that may or may not help you may probably be more benefited by watching somebody doing it or actually participating in it right or let us say you are looking at a scenario where you are trying to test a hypothesis in a new situation now that's a very interesting thing that you are trying to do you are trying to come up with a hypothesis you are actually trying to come up with a concept that you want to test you are trying to apply that in some scenario how it works right which for example in today's context may be applicable to some kind of a uh, what is that um, anti virus uh, treatment that you are trying to come up with right then there could be other things where you need to have uh, concrete experience in terms of sensing or feeling right and i have great examples of this we used to work with a company that sold uh, uh, trucks to people who uh, you know truck drivers and one of the things that they wanted their engineers to do was to go and talk to these truck drivers in their actual environment right because that's the best customer feedback you can get so they used to send them to all the places where trucks used to park for dinner or lunch or whatever it is the uh, engineer is expected to go out to talk, they talk to the truck drivers right now that probably is a great way of getting a sensing of how the uh, customer is feeling the product right and how they're able to understand it so the same thing you may have to apply in some of the things that you're doing where you're trying to figure this out and this is not just one example volkswagen um, discovered many years ago that some of their female drivers are finding it difficult to operate some of their equipment right because they have uh, nail enamel and longer nails and things like that so they made it mandatory for some of their male uh, engineers to actually wear uh, clips on their nails so that they can give the same feeling of how to operate it right so some of these things might give you that kind of experiential learning may be necessary for what you're trying to do right and then the last model that i want to talk about and anybody who has had a kid or who is familiar with children how they learn you will be able to relate to this right a lot of children learn a lot of things by visually looking at what you're doing right how an adult is behaving how something is being done or more importantly depending on what age group the child is they learn it by what is called as kinesthetic doing that is physically doing it right and as adults we can also learn a lot of stuff right so take some of the some of your very physical games right many of the players that we adore and that we like to enjoy are actually doing it not necessarily from their brain but from their spinal cords meaning it has become such automatic behavior that the moment the ball comes to him you know that he's going to dribble and go to the uh, court right it's not that simple of course in terms of the physical sense right there's also the thing that he has to understand the play of the game 
what the coach has decided and how the team is going to play and things like that right there are certain other things where you can learn better by listening to it so music for example right if you want to learn how to sing or you want to learn how to play a musical instrument i'm pretty sure that if i just give you the score on a piece of paper and tell you this is what you need to do you're not going to be able to do it but supposing i give you a guitar and actually strum it for you saying that this is what the b minor means and this is what something else means and then you do it you're probably going to actually get a lot of information right for some of the things reading may be the best way to do it because all of us probably cannot go to antarctica and feel the minus whatever temperature over there so trying to understand some of those scenarios may be the only way to do it is reading now one of the things i want to stress here as we go along is that the learning styles are just to make sure that you understand what works best for you i'm not trying to tell you that this is the learning style that you need to adopt that's the reason why i wanted to present three different learning models so that we can actually figure out what works for what works for us in what scenario the other thing that i want to emphasize here is that you need to use a mix of methods because the more you mix and match the better you are able to learn and the better you are able to find use out of this right it's also possible that you may find that none of these things work for you something else is required right and that's something that i want to emphasize again as well as long as you pick up the right things so for example as i learned about these reading methods i found out for example that music doesn't work for me i also found out that i am finding it easier to read certain kinds of stuff at certain points in time right so if i'm trying to look at a subject like blockchain which i am very interested in right now i try to pick it up and read it first thing in the morning right there are other things that i'm reading for example in terms of uh, autobiographies i read them uh, at the point in time probably after lunch when you know my ability to absorb some things is very low but i'm still interested in these new concepts and new things that people are coming up right so you may need to use a mix of different methods and different study routines how to do this so some subject may be easier to read in a certain kind of environment some subjects may be easier to read as a group right some subjects may be easier to read when you exchange ideas with different people so what you need to do is you need to understand your style and understand what goes on and works for you and be able to use that to your advantage so how do you overcome challenges right i spoke about some of the challenges that we face now the important thing is to try to understand how we can overcome some of those challenges so let's look at some of the opportunities because unless you overcome these challenges success is not going to be easy right especially because a lot of the uh, usual things that we take for granted for example the fact that humans are always on top of the food uh, food chain right humans have always been the smartest thing around is not going to necessarily be true as we go along because of automation because of the rise of cognitive technologies because of the fact that it's cheaper to employ somebody else elsewhere a lot of these things mean that we need to learn how to learn correctly so let's look at some other things that we can do the simplest thing you can do is to shut out distractions get rid of distractions in whatever form they are right now this is very easy from an external perspective trust me because you can actually install a lot of applications a lot of tools on your computers and your mobile phones and things like that which can stop you from getting to the distractions for a long time i used to use a browser extensions which uh, prevented me from going to certain kinds of applications for certain durations of the day and now this may sound very uh, you know uh, heridian are you trying to tell me that i need to control this and i was increasingly getting frustrated but over a period of time it actually made a lot of sense to me because i was able to focus better and now even without those apps i am able to work because i know that i need to do this and i need to do it in a certain way and i need to make sure that i need to achieve a certain goal at the end of this so i am able to do that the other aspect is also trying to free yourself from some of these uh, bad habits you know we always think that i'm going to look at for, uh, facebook for 5 minutes or i'm going to look at my whatsapp messages for a couple of minutes or i am just going to scroll uh, twitter for some time and then before you know it it's the end of the day right and very interestingly a lot of these applications and tools are actually configured to take advantage of some of the difficulties that the brain has so for example if you look at some of these things that if you have already noticed it great otherwise next time you log into one of these things please look them up they all have what is called as an infinite scrolling meaning you can keep on scrolling up and it will keep on giving you something or the other right that's how the brain gets sucked into it we don't know what we're doing with our time and unless you have a hard stop on some of these things either because you have uh, the will power to do it and i'll talk about will power it's not as easy as it sounds or you have a technological solution to stop you from doing this it's not going to work right and between the choice of using will power which is like any muscle which after some time kind of falls in efficiency it's better to use a technological solution use the technology itself to stop you from browsing something or give yourself a certain time to do this again that's a very interesting thing right i'm not saying don't do it i'm saying please block the time during which you will do this which is more advantageous than actually saying i'm not going to do it at all because then that becomes something that your mind starts rebelling against and if you have kids you will see this right if you tell your child him or her that you're not supposed to do this 
they're going to rebel against it. Maybe a better strategy would be to tell them that I'm going to let you do this, but at the following duration or whatever it is. Of course, it's not easy because kids are great negotiators, but you can definitely try this on yourself at least. Now, the physical distractions on the outside are very easy, right? You get rid of all the stuff. You try to make sure that you're able to focus. You are trying to minimize the distractions that can take you away, that kind of stuff. What about things that are inside your head, right? That's a bigger challenge. And I will talk about it as we go along. But to the extent possible, we also need to make sure that we are tagging ourselves to remain within a certain frame of mind, right? And there are many ways you can do that. As long as you're able to keep the distractions at bay, because it's very difficult for anybody to say, I have zero distractions. There's hardly that kind of person around, unless you're some kind of a saint or savant or something like that, who can say that, you know, these things don't apply to me. What we are actually trying to do is uh, trying to make sure that we limit ourselves from falling down into these traps, right? And that's easier and that's doable as well. So let's look at how we can do that. Make it personal, right? It's up to us. It's up to us to decide what this means to me. Right. And you might have noticed this if any of, any of you are trainers or you might have seen that your ability to learn something, your ability to grasp something is very good, then you have a very strong personal bond to what you're doing. Supposing your boss comes and tells you, and, in, and interestingly, this is a true story. One of the reasons I picked up the CISA was because at one point, my then boss told me that, oh, you need to add some skills, otherwise we don't know what you're going to do with that part of the activity that you're doing. Right? And then I said, okay, let's go and figure out what I can do. Let's find something out. And I found, uh, went and walked into a Bangalore chapters, uh, whatever it is for CISA, and here we are, right? So as long as you're able to make it very personal, try to link it to something that you want and try, try to link it to something that's emotional. I will talk about that as well. Try to say what this can mean to you, right? By, by studying this or learning this or picking up some skill, what are you going to be able to do? Are you going to be able to live, live the dream life that you want? Are you going to be able to fulfill the needs and, des uh, needs and desires of your family? Are you be going to be able to actually fulfill the wishes of somebody who was who you looked up to your parents or somebody else who thought that this is what you're going to end up in life as, right? It's very good to do that. And um, you can actually make this something that stands out in your face, right? Make a small piece of paper on which you write why you're doing this. I want to do this because of this. In fact, there's even more data saying that when you pick up such kind of intentions and goals and make them public, you actually hold yourself to them. There's a lot of research which says that we all fail on our New Year's goals because we don't tell them anybody, tell anybody about them. Right? They say that if you make a New Year goal public, tell everybody around you, try to get a buddy system, try to get somebody who's going to hold you accountable to it, you actually stand uh, to gain and to actually be able to do that. Right? Do the same thing here. Try to connect what you're learning and what the outcomes could mean to you. I'm going to get a particular certification. I'm going to get a raise in salary. I'm going to be able to get a promotion. I'm going to be able to jump to a new job. It could be any of those things. Make it personal. That makes a big difference in terms of how you're grasping it and how the, the cognition works within your head. And this is extremely important. Uh, try to engage the emotions and the senses, right? Especially the senses. Uh, the brain is a very sensual thing. It works well when you are trying to actually engage all the senses in terms of hearing, listening, whatever works for you, right? That is the reason why they say that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Because you see that. I take the same slide itself, right? I could have simply written engage the senses and the emotions. That would have had a very different impact vis-a-vis -vis having these three smiley faces over there. Right. And uh, somebody was I was talking to somebody about this slide and she told me that it makes a lot of difference to her that there are three different colors because I could actually use the same color across all the three of them. And then that would have had a different impact on your head. Right. So try to link these things to emotions as possible. Try it because if you pick any memory that you have, the memory that is strongest in your head is going to be the one that has the greatest emotional impact on you. Right. Where you're very angry at that point in time, very, very happy what happened, right? In fact, they also talk about projecting some of these emotions, right? Use that as a trigger to push yourself forward. Use that as a cue to tell yourself that, okay, by doing this, this is what is going to happen and I'm going to be very happy when I do it, right? This sounds like mumbo jumbo. This sounds like new one of those new psychedelic stuff. No, but this is not. This is actually stuff that has been proved by research to indicate that a lot of these things connect and people are able to succeed. Just this morning, I was reading about this uh, person who was... Uh, who had uh, more, you know, mobility disabilities. And he was able to do a lot of things that he heads uh, very large organizations, the design center today. And one of the things he says that everything was something that was very emotional to me because I could not do a lot of stuff. So it had a great emotional impact on me. And I told myself that I'm going to do this, right? Try to engage the emotional side of your brain. Try to connect it to things that make you very happy. Try to build a reward system. I'll talk about it again because the rewards make us happy, right? And uh, what emotions also do to you in your brain is they give you that shot of dopamine. 
though cheap dopamine shots are very easy to get, especially with some of these browsings and likes and things like that. Imagine you're able to translate that into a learning context, right? Uh, for example, the simple thing, and I'll talk about it. Uh, tell yourself that if I finish reading this whole chapter today, I'm going to allow myself to take a bite of chocolate or uh, go watch a five minute movie or have a chat with a friend, any of those things, right? It could make a big difference to you in terms of how you're connecting, how you're absorbing things, how you're learning, all those things can, things can make, uh, can see, a, you will see a sea change in what you're doing. Chunk information, again, this is very, very important uh, because like I told you, the brain has limitations in how much information it can hold, uh, especially in short-term memory. The prefrontal context, which is where cortex, which is where, which is in the frontal part of the brain, actually has a limited ability to hold uh, pieces of information. And there's very easy ways to check, uh, check this, right? Uh, try to recall how you remember telephone numbers, right? You break it down into five or four bits or whatever way that works for you. For example, my mobile number is a 10-digit uh, number, right? And I try to remember it in two chunks of five digits each because that's easier for me to remember. And I know other people who try to remember it as three digits, three digits, three digits, and then last digit, right? So when they tell me in their format, it becomes difficult for me to understand what they're trying to say. Right. So you try to figure out what works for you and how to break that information into smaller bits. Again, this is a very interesting thing to do. Right, Many ways to do it, especially when you have things like numbers and things like that is easy to do because you can try to break it down and figure out what you're trying to remember. Right, Take the information of what you're trying to read in a concept. Right? You're trying to read a paragraph. How can you chunk that information? All you need to do is break that paragraph down to two or three underlying concepts or ideas or whatever it is that they're talking about and then try to remember those things, right? And you will find over a period of time that the brain is able to grasp some of those things very quickly. Some of those things take time, need repetitive learning, right? And that is where, again, chunking is working. That is where the brain's connection mechanisms are working. I will talk about it. The brain is a great pattern engine. It's very good at recognizing patterns. A lot of these patterns come from our, what is called the lizard part of the brain, right? Because how do you think humankind survived over a period of time? Right. Those who understand, understood threats and those who try to remember that seeing the uh, you know grass moving in a certain way and one of my uh, kitten kin getting dragged away by a lion means that it's time for me to run. Right. Otherwise, I won't be in the gene pool. Right. Those kinds of things get reinforced. Right. It's the same thing that you find. If you touch a hot surface once, you will remember it always because you know that this kind of surface is hot and there's a good possibility that it may be hot as well. That's because the information gets codified in a certain way, gets chunked and stored in your brain in a particular way, right? Now, this may sound uh, difficult initially, but as you prepare and as you try to break what you're reading into smaller bits and pieces, right? Uh, or it's, it's as simple as calling it a bite-sized bit. Try to break it up into a small concept and read it and try to use that small pieces of information to store it into long-term memory. It works uh, great wonders. Now, this is, again, something that is very interesting thing that we don't do very often, right? You need to connect what you learn because what you learn cannot be in silos, right? A lot of stuff that we learn has underlying concepts that can be connected with each other, right? And there are a lot of, uh, there are great examples for this. For example, you learned that a specific door can be operated in a certain way. What your brain does then is that it starts trying to apply that concept of opening a container to across everything, right? Take the concept of uh, how you open a bottle, right? Once you open a bottle in a specific way, you start applying that concept to anything else. You're basically abstracting the underlying concept and then trying to apply it elsewhere. Now, this is something that you can do voluntarily, meaning whatever you're reading, you can pick it up and then try to connect it elsewhere. Or you can also pick up the concept and then let it stew in your brain and your brain does the connection. In fact, the, the brain is again very good at connecting these underlying concepts and reinforcing the stuff into storage, right? How it does this is, the, is that when we sleep, I'll talk about it when we come to it, right? But you need to make sure that you're able to connect the different concepts and try to absorb it so that it's not a standalone chunk, right? So supposing you learn... And it need not be something very complicated, right? You learn something that you picked up in TCP IP. You're trying to apply that in risk assessment. How can you do it, right? Or take the concept of what we call in risk defense in depth. How do you understand that, right? Try to apply it to a physical fort, right? How does a fort look like? There is different kinds of protections around the fort, right? There is a moat. There is a gate that separates what's outside the moat from inside the moat. Inside the moat, there are probably crocodiles or sharp pieces or whatever it is. The fort has a strong wall. There are people on top of the wall. So that's what you're trying to do, right? The moment you do this, you will never forget it because the brain is very good at connecting both the pieces. And the interesting thing here is that the brain is also a cue engine, 
Meaning, let's say that you learned the concept of what a fort means when you were a kid, when you went for the first time to a big monument in your country or a place you're visiting. The brain connects that great memory and the feelings that you had with it to anything else that you learned, right? So it becomes very powerful in terms of uh, not only protect, uh, sending that information to memory, but also picking it up and then using it effectively. What else can you do? Use something called the Pomodoro. Right now, again, here I wanted to use the image of the tomato. It's also called a tomato timer. Uh, the tomato timer concept is that you set a timer for 25 minutes and then break whatever you're studying or reading within the 25 minute window. Right now, you may tell me, ah, 25 minutes is not enough for me to get comfortable. Right, because once you start uh, working on something, excuse me, I'm just going to connect my power supply. Once you start working on something, what happens is that you need to get familiar with it, you need to get uh, physically uh, comfortable in the situation and things like that. But what the Pomodoro helps you do is actually it helps you give your brain the time to recover from all the focus it has been putting in. And it need not even be the exact 25 minutes. You don't need a fancy timer like that. You can simply set an alarm clock, alarm on your uh, mobile phone or your laptop or any other device and take a break at a specific period of time. In fact, there's a lot of research which says that the maximum time that you can actually hold yourself and be at the same energy level is about 90 minutes, right? So you can try to break the time down into any chunk that works within that period and apply that to what you're doing. By doing this, what happens? You're not putting a lot of pressure on your, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, focus, right? You're also not putting a lot of pressure on um, your willpower. And willpower has been proven to be very uh, fragile, right? The more you rely on it, the weaker it becomes. And over a period of time, it actually drops in uh, uh, capability. In fact, there's a lot of data where and uh, research where they have proven that if you force people to use their willpower and then give them some cognitive tasks, they fail. So they did a lot of experiments. They made a person sit in a room with a piece of cake and told him that we want you to spend the next 30 minutes around the cake, but you should know you're not expected to eat it. You can only eat it when a, a person from the research team comes and tells you that you can go ahead with it. After this experiment, they made that, give that person a mathematical uh, formula and ask him to solve it. And this law has been proven multiple times that people are not able to solve it as well as they were able to do when they were not asked to exercise their willpower. Right. So using the Pomodoro and things like that helps you break, uh, manage the willpower. First thing. Second thing is it also may, helps you manage your attention focus. Right. Trying to sit in a meeting for a very long period of time. What happens? You, you tend to get distracted. You get bored. You try to focus on 100 things. You don't want to sit there anymore. Right. But try to have a meeting that is broken into a very specific period of time, like what the Pomodoro does in terms of reading. And you'll be able to see the advantage of being able to focus for that period of time. Take a little break and come back and focus on what you're doing again. It works very well. And I can tell you that this works based on a lot of personal experience. I have a number of alarms that I've set for 30 minute blocks. So when I'm reading or I'm trying to focus on something, I try to make sure that I have a 30 minute block and I, you know, the break doesn't have to be very big as well. Right. And it has a lot of psychological and physiological impacts. For example, the strain on the eyes are actually lowered when you're trying to take a break, look at something else and come back at that uh, 30 minute window or whatever window works for you. Try it. Build hooks. This is again a very interesting uh, concept that I've been trying to work on. And I have a lot of people who've been using it in their uh, uh, preparation lives, especially for things like the professional exams, people that come in contact with and they tell me that it works. Now, this is not something that you will find in fancy books. This is something that I have personally experienced. And building hooks is very simple. What I like to call pre-reading or pre-preparing, right? So what it means is that let's say you're going to go and attend a session for a specific topic. What you try to do is try to pick up the syllabus that is going to get covered or the subject matter that's going to get covered and browse through it. So that when you go and actually sit in the classroom or in that uh, meeting, it's all not uh, new stuff, right? Your brain is already familiar with it. And like I told you, the brain is a familiarity engine. It tries to recall and connect different things that it already knows. So the moment it comes across a concept that the person is talking about and you already have browsed through it by looking through the subject, it actually latches onto it. Because there's another thing in that. By the time your person is talking to you in front of you, you've already heard the concept twice. Because once you read it on your own, and second, you're having some person telling you about it, right? Which kind of reinforces learning and then repeats uh, stuff in your mind as well. The other interesting thing that you can do for uh, building hooks is you can look at parts of the books that generally people don't pay attention to. So if you're looking at a book, look at the table of contents, look at the index, look at the notes, right? Look at references that they're making. Because a lot of these things talk about simple concepts in some way, and your brain will pick up those specific keywords that matter. 
so that when you're actually reading that book again or when you're reading that concept again, it gets grasped faster. Right? Other things that you can do, especially from an academic setup, is to try to attempt the exam uh, Q&A kind of thing that's at the back of the book beforehand. Now, I know you may think, oh, I don't know the subject, so you're asking me to attend something where I know I'm going to fail. Right? That's, again, an interesting thing that you need to apply. The brain is good at challenging itself, and it recovers very well from those kinds of challenges where you tell yourself that I'm doing this because I don't yet have the skill. Right? It's a great concept that uh, a lady called Angela Duckworth has explored in the book called Grit. You should look it up, where she talks about the fact that we need to have the right kind of mindset, and I will talk about that as well. So try to build hooks in what you're learning. Hooks help you grasp subjects very well and help you uh, remember and recall for a longer period of time. Now, this is, again, something that we generally are not taught. right? In fact, one of the things I always think of when we come to learning is why we are not getting taught some of these things early on in life. So spaced repetition is a very interesting concept where you don't immediately pick up what you have just read and read it again and again, right? It's called master practice. That is what we like to do. So if I'm supposed to learn chapters one to 10, I go through them once, I pick it up again after some period of time and read it, or I read chapter one multiple times, chapter two multiple times, or read the same thing again and again, right? We, because This is because the more you read it, the more the brain gets familiar and the more the brain convinces you that you need know this concept already. Right? Whereas in spaced repetition, what they are trying to tell you, and there are different rules that apply to it, but at the basic level, what they're trying to tell you is that when you read something, don't try to approach it again at all. Give it a break. Sleep over it. In fact, sleep is recommended because sleep tries to consolidate uh, what you've read and pushes it back to uh, uh, long-term memory. Right. So with spaced repetition, what you're trying to do is you read something, rest on it for a couple of days, pick it up a little later and look at it again. Right, because at that time, what happens? The brain is already starting to forget some of these things. In fact, there is beautiful research on at what durations you need to pick it up to read. Some people say you need to do it at the second day, you need to do it the fifth day, seventh day, ninth day, depending on what you're trying to read. The idea being that as you give time and read, there's a little bit of difficulty being built in. Right, your brain has a difficulty in recalling it, which kind of triggers it off, saying that oh, I don't remember this. And then you read it again; it reinforces because the brain's already hungry for some other concepts that you learned but you don't remember, right? So space repetition is something that you can definitely try and I can vouch for it, it works quite well. You can also try to challenge yourself, right? Now, this is again an interesting concept. This is basically setting yourself up to fail. When I say fail, I'm not saying that you invest a million dollars and lose all of it. What I'm basically saying is that accept that when you learn something, you may not remember or recall all of it. And there is nothing wrong in not being able to recall everything because nobody or not everybody claims to have what is called as a photographic memory, right? I look at it once, I'll remember it forever. Not everybody can do that. What happens when you challenge yourself is you're putting yourself in what is called as acceptable difficulty, meaning you try to read something, you go back and try to take an exam uh, of that subject or that uh, subject matter or try to recall it or try to make a few notes about it and you may or may not recall everything. If you don't recall everything, that's actually great news. It means that your brain is going to struggle the more it struggles, the more open it becomes to absorbing and accepting some of the stuff and helps you recall better, right? In fact, this is again something that uh, today I have seen some of the kids getting taught, right? Please challenge yourself, meaning don't make it so easy that you can actually say that I know everything. Basically, you try to set up yourself in such a way that uh, you're able to question what you know and then build on what you don't know. Again, the interesting concept is that uh, many books today, especially academic books, are getting redesigned from this perspective. That is why you will find that even a lot of the Isaka content has some pre-questions, meaning things that you can ask yourself, what am I going to learn kind of stuff. Because when you build that concept, you're asking yourself what I don't know, and then that connects it when you read and you try to understand what you're trying to do, right? Again, interesting concept of something called interleave learning. Uh, as the image tells you, what we often do, especially in school and college, is we try to pick up one topic uh, and then, uh, or we don't do this actually, meaning we don't pick up one topic, read it and go to another topic because we believe that I'm supposed to read only topic one all through. This whole week I'm going to read topic one, next week I will read topic two, next week I will read topic three kind of thing. Whereas the brain is very configured for novelty, like I told you, right? So supposing you're able to pick up the concept of picking up multiple subjects and reading them. So one day you read physics, another day you read chemistry, one day you read, for example, COVID and some of its controls, the other day you read uh, risk concept, the other day you read uh, something else, an emotional learning, whatever it is, the brain actually grasps because it's already open to many of these ideas, number one. 
Number two is when you try to read multiple subjects, the brain is always trying to find connections between these things, which means that your memories get strengthened. Your ability to remember and recall becomes very, very strong. It becomes very easy for you to uh, not only store it in memory, but also recall it. It becomes very, very easy to do that. What else can you do? You can also do what is called as varying practice. Now, this is a very interesting thing. And this concept has been very, very effectively applied in many of the athletic fields, right? Where supposing you're going to the gym, they tell you that it doesn't make sense for you to simply pump muscles all the day, right? You vary, vary what you're doing because then you're going to build uh, the right kind of resilience in all your muscles. You're also going to build the right kind of resistance and resistance is what builds muscle. Right, because if you keep doing the same five kilos every day, it's not going to make any sense. You do five kilos one day, you give do ten kilos one day. You take a break, you come back and do it. You're basically surprising the muscle into building the resistance, which is exactly what you need to do from a learning perspective. Now, this may sound. Uh, uh, you may ask me, how would you do this? Very simple. For example, you're trying to pick up a concept on a specific topic in, let's say, risk management. You pick it up, you do a couple of quizzes, you do some test tests yourself, try to recall what you're doing, forget about it, and go and pick up something else and try it. So what happens in this scenario is that you will definitely not be able to remember all of it, right? Which means that you are already at a little bit of a psychological disadvantage in terms of, oh, I don't know this, which actually primes your brain to be able to remember better so that the next time you read something, you absorb more of it. And this varying practice can be done at multiple levels of difficulty as well. Meaning you are trying to learn a concept and if there is a graduated learning scale, there's a level one learning and there's a level five learning, you can actually mix both of them. Right? Because I will talk about it, especially when we talk to creativity, this whole concept of flow is built on that, where you're trying to actually make sure that you are at the edge of your capabilities and edge of what you learn. That's when actual learning happens. Otherwise, you get bored or you get anxious. I will talk about it. Try to vary practice. It works uh, beautifully. Then last but not the least, you need to leverage the strengths of the brain. Right? The brain is a wonderful organ. And uh, though there is a lot of uh, anecdotal news that you know, we use only 5% of our brain or 10% of our brain or whatever it is, it is proven to be not true, right? So we need to leverage the strengths of the brain. I, I don't know how many of you have watched the Sherlock Holmes series. You will notice that Sherlock Holmes uh, practices something called a memory palace, right? This is a very interesting concept and is something that even the people in ancient Greece used to practice. And this is something that you and I can practice as well. This is basically about building this huge building in your mind and find, trying to put different pieces of information in different places and build the right cues on how to do it, right? And I do this, I've tried to do this in different scenarios and it works beautifully. For example, my apartment has 19 houses in it, my apartment building, right? So I try to put different things in different places. For example, all the odd numbered houses have certain kinds of information. I try to put them in my head. The penthouse that is on top of the building has certain information that I want to keep there. Why does this work, right? There is something called the hippo hippocampus in the brain, which is responsible for all kinds of learning, which is responsible especially for strengthening what we learn. This hippocampus has a role in moving things from short-term memory to long-term memory. And it has been proven that uh, uh, basically what the hippocampus does is uh, it works on what is called spatial memory. And there's a lot of research, you can actually look it up. Uh, it's called the London taxi driver research, that the London taxi drivers actually have bigger hippocampuses than non-taxi drivers in London. The idea being that as you drive more, as they try to recall physical spaces, the brain becomes stronger and that part of the brain grows, right? You can actually use that to your advantage. And many of us are actually having very good spatial uh, skills. You might, even, for example, I know a lot of people who, if they go to one uh, location in one particular route, can always remember it no matter what. They know how to take a left or right or whatever it is, right? Maybe that's something that you can use to your advantage. Try to build these memory palaces where you're storing data in different contexts in different ways and then use the right kind of cues to recall that. Then, of course, mnemonics. How many of us have heard of uh, mnemonics, right? Mnemonics are nothing but short uh, combinations of words, right? The simplest mnemonic I'm sure you've heard is what is called Vidyar, which is violet, indigo, blue, uh, green, that kind of thing. Basically, to tell you what is the order of the colors in the rainbow. Right, and there are other mnemonics uh, like that as well. For example, how do you process a mathematical uh, equation? Right, there is something called board mass bracket of division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. Right, or if you try to remember uh, the uh, order of the planets, right, my, my very um, uh, energetic mother served as nine pizzas. Right, so what does it mean? We are talking about Mercury, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, Mars, what are new Neptune, and of course, P now Pluto doesn't exist because uh, they have declared it no longer a planet. But if you learn this in childhood, right, you will remember it forever. 
it's not just man mnemonics that you can pick up there are other similar tools as mnemonics right i don't know how many of you have been taught this method of remembering which months of the year have 30 days and 31 days right so as a kid i was taught that any month that comes on your knuckle i don't know if you're able to see my hand is actually having 31 days so january february march april may june right all these things are tools to basically drive something into your memory please use things like that and some of these things may be easily available some of these things you can pick up on your own you can build your own little mnemonics rule which you use to store and um, learn information and store it in your brain then of course there is the whole concept of visualizing stuff right and this is the reason why they say that uh, there is like a, a a picture is worth a thousand words right visualize stuff try to look at what you can do and how you can remember and recall some of these things then of course there is the whole concept of the mindset right and this may sound again like mumbo jumbo saying that oh you know this is i'm not talking here in terms of uh, things like positive affirmations or things like that they do work but this particular mindset idea that i'm talking about is basically trying to tell yourself that you can learn anything right this is the whole concept that angela duckworth talks in her book called grit where she says that we need to tell ourselves that if i've not learned something it's because i've not learned something yet it's not because i can never learn it right and this seems to work there a lot of uh, kids are being taught this concept because this is whole idea that you are either a natural or you're not this mindset idea and a lot of research around it tells you that it's not always the case right it actually is uh, uh, possible to use that okay the other interesting concept that you can put in place to make sure that you're learning effectively is to build and stack habits again this is something that uh, I, i learned a lot from a book called atomic habits i highly recommend that if you've not read it please read it because habits make things automatic right and that is why they say that please build good habits and that is why they also say that it's very difficult to get out of bad habits right then there's also this interesting piece of information available out there that it may take anywhere between 30 to 45 days to build the habit right what the habit stacking basically talks about is trying to build one habit over the other right so one of the things that you can probably do is for example is that if you want if you want to tell yourself that i want to read something and i want to read it in such a way that i absorb it then you try to build some other habit on top of it that helps you do that right that brings you the cue of saying that okay if i come and sit in a particular seat this is what i'm going to do if i am at a particular time of the day i'm going to read the subject right so that then the brain cues itself to do that right that is what they're talking about in terms of the cue cue the craving the reward and the response so you cue as a cue yourself as soon as you wake up you put something in front of you which reminds you that you need to do some activity or you need to read something or you need to get something done uh, then you build a reward to it you give yourself something nice right this is like uh, what we do to dogs and kittens and kids and things like that right uh, give them a little treat to, for good behavior try to do that to yourself and the response could be that your mind starts building the right kind of loop it's building a positive feedback loop that helps you keep doing that and there are many ways of doing this and there are many ways of using this to your advantage again links back to the spatial memory concept that i was talking about so one of the things if you look uh, in the places of people who have a lot of bad weather you will find that things like umbrellas things like shoes and these days uh, things like masks are actually right next to the door right in my house i have masks and sanitizer right next to the door because i know that as i'm leaving the house or as i'm coming in i may need to use one of these products right or anybody who is used to a lot of rainy weather might actually have a umbrella hanging next door right because you're trying to make it easy for you to grab it as you go along so that you don't have to search for it right or you're trying to build one of those little uh, catch all uh, bowls that you have where as soon as you come in you put your uh, glasses into it or put your keys into it whatever it is right you're trying to build that little habit around it which is the same thing that you're trying to do when you're trying to do it from a mental perspective so that you are able to absorb it one of the interesting things that we need to try to do is also build the right kind of cues meaning cue is a trigger right so the moment i see this for example if you see a lot of these old uh, sticky notes that used to come they used to come in a single color which is that yellow color right today there are different colors of notes and i know a lot of people who are actually using different color notes for different purposes so how do i use a yellow color what does it mean a red means something else kind of thing so that you are actually trying to visually cue yourself into doing something last but not the least this is not uh, some crazy signs on the screen this is actually trying to tell us to get some sleep right very often one of the things that the biggest thing that suffers today is people don't get enough sleep and there's tons of research out there which tells us that even a small amount of loss in sleep leads to a very steep fall in cognitive strength 
right? And there's tons of research on this, especially things where people are doing physical activities. They have done research on truck drivers and found that the fewer hours of sleep they get, the larger the possibility of them causing accidents, right? And not getting sleep also affects your brain's ability to absorb and store information. In fact, there's research out there which says that uh, you do a lot of storage, a lot of what is called as consolidation of memory happens. That is moving things from short-term memory to long-term memory happens when you sleep. And that too, when and in a particular part of the sleep, there are two kinds of sleep that we go through. One is called REM sleep. And the REM sleep is when the coordinate, the consolidation happens. So they generally suggest that you need to make sure that you get that REM and uh, non-REM sleep, right? And generally these sleeps come in cycles, about 90 to uh, 95 minutes. So they say that you need to time your wake-up cycle as well in that, right? And again, there are a lot of apps and tools that can help you do that, that can help you track and time it in such a way that you actually wake up at the right point in your sleep cycle so that you're fresh and able to absorb stuff rather than making up cranky and, uh, you know, upset with whatever it is the other side to it is also that uh, there's a lot of uh, false understanding that uh, sleep is additive meaning not addictive additive meaning that if you don't sleep today enough hours you can actually sleep for the over the weekend that's not how the body works right so if you sleep five hours every day and you think that on the weekend you're going to work 10, sleep 10 hours it doesn't work that way it doesn't help you because the brain and the body are not configured to do that there's a lot of recommendation out there which tells you that you need to get about seven to eight hours of sleep Again, some of there are exceptions, people who actually sleep only for five hours or four hours, but they are the exception there rather than the norm. And we need to get some sleep because the sleep is a very important point in the brain's uh, cycle where the brain actually flushes out a lot of the junk that is there, right? A lot of the hormones and the chemicals that are generated in the brain get flushed out and the brain consolidates what it has learned. So please get some sleep. So what have we discussed till now is all relating to how to go about learning. So you might ask me, what about creativity, right? Creativity is again a very important uh, aspect and something that we all need to be very, very on our toes with. Because if you look at some of the data that I have, it very clearly tells you that the future is going to need a lot of creative power from the human being, not just your ability to you know, do some of the tasks that a machine or an artificial intelligence uh, program or something else can actually take over. A lot of the physical things are going to go out of the equation, right? And uh, this is some of the data that I came across, right? Top 10 skills in 2025. Just look at what is in there, right? Hardly one or two actual hard technology or science-based stuff is in there. For example, the number one skill is analytical thinking and innovation, right? Active learning and learning strategies. These are going to be top learning skills. This is not something that I'm making up. This is something that the World Economic Forum has actually researched. And this is something that's brand new data just released a couple of months ago, right? The number three skill in that is complex problem solving which means that this is about being able to step back from something. This is able to apply abstract thinking. This is able. This is being able to look at the patterns in the data and say, this is what it could mean, right? This is about fungibility of the learning that you have, meaning I have learnings from a specific domain or a specific skill set. How can I apply it to some other domain or area or how can I do it, right? Look at some of the other things. Number one skill, number five skill is creativity, originality, and initiative, right? Some of these things you cannot teach an algorithm to do, right? Look at other things in there, reasoning, problem solving, ideation. All of these things are basically trying to tell us that we need to be creative. Creativity is going to make a big difference as we go along, right? The other aspect that I want to talk about also is that creativity is going to be very important in making sure that that gap between the cognitive technologies, between the robotics and the, the AI and the ML and things like that continues to remain and continues to enable and favor the human beings right it's in the little gap between the cognitive technologies and what human beings can do today is where we are all going to thrive right because for all a lot of things for example there's a huge trust towards uh, making sure that autonomous vehicles are there right which means it's going to take away things like having the need to drive or looking at some of those uh, skills a lot of the data that everybody else generates is going to get crunched into come up with solutions for a lot of the standard problems right which means that you're going to be able to use your skills for some of these new age things that no, no machine can do or it cannot be done basis the data by itself right so what can we do to be more creative how can you foster creativity right if this is not um, something that can be easy to do right so there is no formula for it. You can't say A plus B is going to give you this amount of creativity. What you need to be able to do is set the right kind of settings and right kind of criteria to make sure that you are creative. So some of the things that you can do and things that we don't do today, right? 
today we are all so focused on productivity and making sure that our time is well spent that we over schedule ourselves right we make sure that we are always doing something which means that you don't have the time to sit and look at something and what happens when you just don't do anything is when your brain starts working i'm sure you have felt this and i have felt it many times right i have been working on something and or i'm trying to solve a problem or come up with something new for a client and the insight comes to me when i am not doing any activity right i'm walking somewhere or i'm out shopping or i'm on a jog or a walk or whatever it is is when that idea strikes me right and this is only going to be possible when you allow yourself give yourself permission to be not productive right because if you go and tell me i'm pro- i'm productive and this is what i'm going to do it may or may not work right if you tell people that i'm not going to be productive people look at you funny there's been a little bit of a bias towards being productive but unless you allow yourself that freedom to actually step out and do something you only then you're going to become uh, creative and you're going to let that insight come into your head right the next thing that you can do is you can encourage serendipity right serendipity is letting chance and options take their course my favorite example for this is uh, newton's discovery of uh, gravity right do you think it's going to it would have happened if he had been sitting in uh, in front of a screen or reading a book and saying this is what is going to happen he probably was doing that right he was reading a scientific concept or something like that but he also allowed himself to be in a place where something happened and he was able to connect those things it's just not newton there's also a lot of examples right think of archimedes how did he come up with the concept that you can weigh something by using that liquid right he was taking a shower and that's when that idea hit him right or the discovery of even something like the benzene ring it happened to that german scientist when he was sleeping and he dreamt of a snake biting its own tail and that's when he connected it and it didn't happen by itself right he had been working on the concept for a very long period of time he had tried different permutation combinations it didn't happen and then that's how he came up with it a lot of examples like that the whole idea of the uh, periodic table and the connectivity of all the elements in it actually is supposed to have come through this in fact the discovery of some of the elements which are not really readily found in nature happened because somebody was sleeping and when they arranged all the elements by the weights so realized that there was a gap there which meant that there was something missing over there right so you need to allow yourself to encourage and feel this serendipity this is uh, you this is not something that i can exactly tell you this is what you need to do but you need to allow yourself the freedom to be uh, for things to happen to you right you need to get yourself into the state of flow right so this is not something that you know i'm not saying go and uh, get into wind surfing or water surfing or whatever it is i'm only saying try to apply the concept of what mihale his second name is very difficult to pronounce and uh, you might have to go and look up a google site which allows you to pronounce this but it's supposed to be mihale chisle mihale right uh, who came up with this concept of flow what he says is that you are at the right spot to learn and pick up something when you are actually at the edge of your abilities and your challenges right so this little yellow block where you are actually focused and happy because you have the right kind of abilities and you're also on the right level of challenge for what you want to do is when you start learning and when you enjoy what you're doing and there are a lot of examples of this of musicians of uh, artists of uh, uh, sportsmen and sports sports women and things like that who experience flow when they are at that level where they are almost exhausted from falling and when they actually reach the goal right and you can see some of these things this is a beautiful diagram and and the concept is very nicely explained here right so if you are at the low end of your abilities but you are somewhere in the mid range of your capabilities of what you are trying to do that is sort of what you need to achieve then you are in a very state of worry because you are worried that you are not going to be able to do this right if the challenge is very high but your capabilities are very low then you are in a very high state of stress or anxiety right so you can look at how it works look at boredom right you are somewhere at a very low level of challenge right it's let's say you it's a puzzle that you've already solved and you're trying to solve it the fifth time your abilities are pretty good level but the challenge is not there you probably bored you don't want to do this right you are abilities at a very high level but the challenge is very low you're trying to play a game of chess with somebody who's you know is does has not played the game or is not in the same level of uh, strength as you are then you are in this state of relaxation right so different uh, parts of this tell you where you can be so what you need to be able to do is get at that right point of where your abilities and the challenge are pretty much uh, congruent right and this is not something that you can easily get but you will know when you get it because for example you don't know the flow of time you don't uh, not distract by anything else right you don't feel tired you feel happy when you are at that point in time that's the state of mind that you need to get into and the more you get in there it not only helps learning it also helps you be creative and find out new solutions to problems and uh, things like that
again an interesting concept you need to practice what i like to call openness right especially in today's world where we are all living in our own what are called filter bubbles this practicing openness becomes very very important right and what i mean by practicing openness is being open to different kinds of ideas and thoughts very often we are all stuck with our own philosophies our own uh, and you know the technology is actually pushing a lot of these things further right we are uh, with the same kind of whatsapp groups we only follow the same kinds of facebook pages we only read the same kind of news channels we only look at the same kind of twitter handles and feeds so what happens is that we live in some kind of a bubble where it kind of reinforces our own thinking we don't allow anything else new to come in right in fact i read this great uh, quote uh, a couple of years some time ago where they said that uh, you know the sign of a mature intelligence is to be able to hold two different conflicting lines of thought in your head and still be able to function right two counterpoints just imagine that if you're able to hold both the counterpoints look at somebody else's point of view also and then be able to understand what they're doing what kind of uh, situation do you think you're going to be in you can be very successful right because you're able to empathize you're able to understand their point of view and you're also not getting bogged down by their point of view or my point of view there's no ego in there right you're trying to solve a problem and that is what we want as we go along because as we go along as the machines drop out of the problem solving scenarios it's only going to be other humans that you're going to be working with which brings me to another interesting concept that you can do to build the better creativity is to build a time for it in your schedule right and i call it do nothing time there is this whole movement out there called do nothing right where you're actually trying to block periods of your time where you don't do anything and if you look at any popular creative person's uh, autobiography or uh, any of their writings you will find that they have actively gone out of their way to build in these periods of time when their time is sacrosanct right you take bill gates you take anybody else for that matter right they try to build in that periods of time where they don't do anything else but do their own thing it could be reading it could be writing it could be problem solving listening to music whatever you want the idea being that when you combine this with certain aspects such as serendipity and having an open mind and things like that you actually open up the doors for creativity right and the other important thing the last uh, last couple of slides i want to talk about is what the whole concept of being here and now right this again sounds like one of those new age stuff but it isn't this is this whole concept of being mindful being present in the here and now right just ask yourself for a moment and i don't want answers here i just want you to think to yourself how much you are able to focus and listen to what i am saying and what is on the slides vis-a-vis what else your mind is thinking right the more you are distracted somewhere the more you are looking at something else it means that you are not able to focus and understand this and this has implications not just from a professional perspective it also has implications from a very personal perspective right imagine being able to spend time with your family with your loved ones with your children by being then and in the present it makes a huge difference in the quality of what you're doing and then trying to bring that to your work or your learning or creativity or whatever it is you will find that it makes a big difference right of course uh, as we go along the, uh, the need to collaborate and connect and co-create with other human beings is going to be very important you're not going to be able to stand alone and say that i'm the only person who's doing everything right which means to be creative you need to be able to open to other people's point of view you need to be able to collaborate you need to be able to stay away from what is called as group think right because we all come together and we all agree on a certain thing doesn't mean we're all being creative or we are actually achieving some of the goals you need to make sure that you are able to work in an integrated way without getting bogged down into some of the ego stuff but still work in such a way that you are able to leverage some of the things that the group as a whole can bring what mit calls an anti disciplinary approach to problem solving that's going to be a great way to be more creative again i thought this uh, is worth uh, repeating uh, please try to get as much sleep as possible because sleep has proven to be again one of the greatest uh, tools for effective creativity if you look at some of the examples i gave you relating to the benzene ring or to the formulation of the uh, 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 periodic table or a lot of those other things a lot of those ideas came to people in their sleep in fact if you read some of the autobiographies some of the people who are most creative one of the things that they have claimed to do is actually keep a piece of paper and pencil right next to their beds because they say that in the middle of the night they get ideas or something and then they're able to jot it down it's probably one of the reasons why they always tell you when you're struggling with a problem and you're trying to solve something to sleep over it because they know that by doing that you are actually going to allow the brain to consolidate different ideas consolidate different concepts and bring it to a fruition and tell you that this is what you can do to solve a particular problem right so before we close i just want to stop with this uh, idea saying that uh, not all of this is going to happen overnight not all of this is going to be done immediately 
in fact uh, very interestingly just to share share that insight that i was trying to figure out how to close this what kind of uh, information can i give you to sum up this whole thing and i was really looking flipping through this book called hegarty and creativity uh, it's by a gentleman called john hegarty and which is when i saw this image and i thought that it makes a lot of sense right because we need to understand that all this change all this creativity that we want to bring all this learning that we want to bring is not going to happen overnight so there is no please don't be frustrated if you start applying some of these things and you don't see results tomorrow because today we are so used to seeing some of these results immediately that we you know everything comes to us automatically right you order something today it gets delivered to you tomorrow morning that is kind of making us focused on getting results immediately instead please give it some time allow yourself the patience and i'm pretty sure you will see the results that you want to see that's pretty much uh, what i had uh, i I've, i've just put some of these uh, concepts that we discussed in terms of words because sometimes people like to see them on these uh, two slides i will happily share these slides with you so that you can look them up at your uh, convenience i also thought that it might be useful to have a list of resources you will notice that most of these resources are actually books that i thought were very useful from the perspective of what we are discussing again i'm uh, happy to share this and uh, please uh, pick up or whichever of them are useful to you and then uh, go through them i'm going to stop here and open the floor up to any questions or thoughts or comments that you have i see that there are a lot of uh, hands have been raised so uh let's uh, switch to them i thank you ragu for your presentation yep uh, uh ladies and gentlemen joining us all over the world allow me to recognize uh, members of the different chapters that uh, uh join us all members of board and all those who are joining us from the different chapters we have questions that have already been asked over the chat uh Ragu maybe you would want to answer this question first and we pick now uh people who are in the podium who want to put up their hands sure uh, so there's a yeah. uh, question here saying that uh, one of the topics uh, one of the models that i presented uh, which of the three learning models are the most popular the one that i personally like and i think that uh, makes a lot of sense from the perspective of what you're discussing is what is known as a done and done learning model because it's very comprehensively presents you different uh, slices and dices of how you can look at things right so for example i have seen it and you might have seen it or you've had experience saying that if you're physically not okay the mind doesn't work well right if the temperature is too high you're not able to sit comfortably if you are not able to uh, if you're thirsty for example your mind doesn't focus right so the done and done learning model is probably very useful because it helps you look at the different perspectives and try to pick one that works for you best okay so there's a great question by william here he says uh, could you also help try paint a picture of about how professional certification bodies are trying to incorporate learning in these changing times not very many new certifications have been introduced yet more new skills are being required as per your presentation great question william thank you so much uh, let me answer that in uh, multiple pieces uh, first and foremost is that many of the certification bodies are actually changing the way they are presenting the learning material to you right that is why i gave you the example that uh, some of them give you summaries at the beginning of the chapter some of them giving give you uh, questions on what you will learn from this some of them give you uh, test questions to pre test yourself to find where you stand right that's one of the things they're doing second is that they're also giving you this content in multiple ways if you look at it when i was in college or probably many of you were in school or college there was only one way you could grasp information which was through a book right today they are giving that information to you in so many different uh, ways so they're basically trying to tell you that uh, you can read it as a book you can read it as a pdf file on a screen you can get it as a message in some format that is consumable to you you can listen to it right so they're giving you multiple options to make sure that because this is not about as you rightly said not about the certifications but being able to add the right kind of uh, skills to what you have we have another question here so i'm going to pick it up there are so many theories about the numbers of hours of one should sleep so from my experience what do you recommend right okay so one of the things i want to recommend here is that uh, you should read a book called why we sleep uh, has a great set of insights into what works and what doesn't work and things like that my personal experience uh, has been that anywhere between 7 to say 8 hours of sleep is very good good for anybody to get because uh, that at least i find a lot of people in that range are actually good and most of us have the physiology for getting that 7 or 8 hours of sleep what happens when you don't sleep is that a lot of the things that your brain does when you're sleeping don't happen 
right? So it's very difficult for you to absorb data. You're very physically tired. Your brain doesn't recall a lot of stuff. Things don't get processed the way they should be getting processed, right? So get as much sleep as you can. And the quantity of sleep that you need varies as you age, right? So that's another thing that you need to keep in mind and then try to figure out uh, what works for you. I'm going to switch down to uh, uh, also doing something called ancient brain and mastery brain exists in humanity. Okay, uh, I will take that off time if you don't mind. Yeah. Sorry. Can we have questions online? Yes, please. Uh, we, please. Can, we can welcome the audience to ask questions Absolutely. live. Yes, please okay. go ahead. Please put up your hands and, and we can have you. Okay, uh, Raghu can continue answering questions on the right. chat. As I, I don't see any hands up. Okay, uh, there's a great question by Clifford here where, where he says, uh, which method can I adopt to learn effectively while combining a job that takes uh, lots of time in a non-serene environment? So this is again something that affects a lot of us, noise. So one of the simplest things you can try to do is try to isolate the noise. So if you may not be able to sit in an isolated location, simple thing you can do is to invest in a very cost-effective, what is called as over-the-ear headphone, right? It doesn't even need to be connected to anything. And I've used this a lot. I'm not talking about a very fancy, uh, you know, noise-canceling headphone or something. It's something that helps you isolate the noise. The moment you do that, you will see a huge uh, impact on uh, uh, what you're learning and how you're learning because the brain then tries to isolate the senses, uh, the inputs that you get from different senses because the brain has limitations of how many inputs at a time it can take. So if you have noise, if you have something visually presented to you and if something else is happening around you, it becomes difficult for the brain to focus and concentrate on that. I hope I answered your question, Clifford. Okay. I saw uh, uh, some hands had gone up uh, initially. So if there are anybody has any questions, please let me know. Okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm not saying an hand up. If one comes, we'll definitely continue to the next yep. uh, one minute. Let's see. Yep. Does uh, maybe Rag with just uh, a small uh, question for you? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, given that uh, from your presentation, you have given us insights on how the 2025 or the next uh, many years would look like, right? Uh, what should somebody who is in a sector that does not seem to look like what 2025 looks like or future looks like do right now? What is the nature of learning that is required? Right. Uh, that's a great question. One of the things we need to remember is that a lot of the change happens at what's called the edges, right? So whatever sector you are in, try to figure out what are the edges of your sector. So for example, if you're in the banking sector, try to figure out what is the edge of the banking sector, where banking talks to payment services, banking talks to something else, because very often change starts from there, right? It's a typical camel in the tent story. The camel starts creeping in. I don't know if you heard the story. The story goes that somebody gave space to a camel to sleep inside the tent. And when the camel initially started off, it started off with its head and ended up the whole body. Right? That's what happens in change. It creeps in so slowly that you don't know what's going on. So constantly be on the lookout for what is happening, first thing. Second thing is try to figure out how you can be part of the change. Right Now, one of the things that, again, the learning models talk about is that there are lots of different kinds of people and how they sit on the change continuum. There are people who wait for the change to come to them and then there are people who start the change or go to the change and say, let me figure out, right? So in your industry or sector, please go and figure out who are the uh, thought leaders, right? What are the sources of information for these people? And then look at that to see what you can learn and what new skills may be coming up. Or look at other countries, for example, because many times some of these things are happening in some other region and they have an impact uh, on you. I okay. hope I answered your question. Yep. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, let us recognize uh, members from uh, Port Harcourt uh, chapter. We have members joining us from uh, different uh, chapters. Maybe we could just type the chapters. Uh, as let us recognize yep. uh, our board members uh, who, are, who have joined us. The immediate past president is there, Mr. Akios. Uh, Glory is around. We also had our past president, Mr. Singoma. I hope he's still on the chat. 
on the call. Uh, Mr. Rago, we want to thank you so much. As I can see, there are no more questions. And sure. uh, on behalf of uh, Isaka Kampala chapter, we would like to thank you so much for the presentation. You are always invited to be in Kampala, Uganda. You are always invited to, pre to present always. We are so grateful. This has been so insightful. At least yeah. I can say I did not only learn how to learn, but I was learning in the process, which is something very good. Uh, for our dear members who have joined us today, on the 10th of December, we have an uh, annual general meeting that is scheduled to start at uh, 7 p.m. It's African time. Please, a link that has been shared, endeavor to attend. We have other activities that have been lined up. Always check on our Facebook, our Twitter, and our social media accounts. If you would like to rewatch this presentation, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Isaka Kampala Chapter, and you'll have it. We are going to upload the presentations on the Engage, so you need to log in and access uh, after being shared by the presenter. Uh, at this moment, I would like to invite uh, 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 Glory to give us the closing remarks. Uh, Jimmy, before Sorry. that, I think there was a, somebody had raised a hand. If you don't mind, maybe we, I think it was Rita. Okay, please. Uh, Rita, Rita. If you don't, Rita okay. I thought I saw your hand go up. Uh, did you want to say something? Yes, Rita. Maybe you're on mute. I don't know. Yeah, allowed to talk. Uh, yes. Rita, uh, I thought I saw her hand go up. Okay, no, no, no problem. Glory, please. Yeah. Thank you, Rego, for your time. We appreciate it. Jimmy, you've uh, really concluded the session. I have nothing else to add and just to say thank you to Ragu, to the attendees, and for today's session. Thank you so much, all of you, and thank you for joining. Yes. I thank you everyone for participating. It was a pleasure connecting. My contact details are available. Please feel free to reach out to me in case I can share any other information or I can help in any other way. Thank you, Bernard, Glory, and the entire chapter team for having me. It's a pleasure talking to all of you. Good day and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Raghu. Good, good night. Good night.